talking about excretions and accidents, once upon a time, I have to tell you, there's this place in San Francisco, and a lot of my education, I guess, has happened right there at the Sutro Bathhouse. And I guess I have to describe it. It's a big building, like an old warehouse, and it's sort of inside, it's sort of divided up, maybe you can think of it as three sections. Actually, sort of two buildings with a courtyard in between. And then courtyard is, is totally closed off and enclosed, except that part of the roof slides back so that you can sunbathe in the daytime. And there's a sunbathing deck that's up kind of close to the closer to the roof than the floors because this thing is like two stories tall, or it would be three stories, except the ceilings are really high. So each of the buildings has two floors, an upstairs and a downstairs, and there's the patio in between. And the patio is filled with plants, and the sun deck takes up part of it, and the jacuzzi, you know, is surrounded by plants, it's over at one side. And the bigger building is mainly made up of private rooms, these little cubicles that you rent for like a dollar an hour, or if you get a double size, it's like a single bed in there and just room to get by it. Or if you get the double size, there's, you know, it's a double bed and room to get by it. And it's two dollars an hour. And also on that side is to see the sauna, and there's a shower room, and a couple little small lounge areas, and um, the couple's room, which is sort of like a big room with a lot of sofas and beds where couples can have orgies. And there's a maze where it's sort of like, you know, the fun house. It's like these black painted walls, narrow corridors, up ramps, down ramp stairs, little cubicles where you can't hardly see, and people sneak into there and do nasty things. Also in the maze, there's a large room, an orgy room, that has a sling hanging over a bed, which I don't get into that, but... Okay, so that's pretty much the big building and then on the other side there's it's two stories and downstairs there's locker rooms a pinball room a restaurant a beauty parlor a massage room upstairs there's a tv room and uh, up for porno movies big screen the office area so that gives you an idea well anyway men and women go here and pretty much do what they feel like doing as long as they don't give offense to other people like you can get kicked out really quick for hassling anybody but it's not considered hassling to walk up to somebody and in a friendly way ask them if they'd like to fuck you know so it's a pretty loose get an idea as we go along so anyway i'm cruising around one night you know from the jacuzzi to the tv room just seeing who's there and who looks friendly there's this one really nice looking lady you know i mean with makeup, she could be a model, you know, I mean, but she didn't really have on makeup and had a really nice body, maybe a few pounds overweight, 10 pounds, not too bad, 15 maybe, big tits. She was with this older guy. He approached me first, you know, like the lady wasn't being all that friendly, she would smile and everything. But she was wandering around somewhere and he came up to me and he said, Son, hey, if you play your cards right, you know, maybe she'll, she'll let you fuck her. And he says, Son, Tell her you like her tits. He says, don't let on that I told you this, but, you know, just tell her you like her tits. And I says, okay. <laughs> so he fades away, and a little while later, I see the tomb again, you know. And I kind of wander up and smile at her, and she smiles, and I says, God, you got gorgeous tits. So she says, thank you, thank you. She says, and looks down at my dick. She says, you're pretty well equipped yourself, or something like this. Now, here's where I'm talking about a big dick comes in handy sometimes. It gets attention. So, but they kind of faded away, you know, and I mean, like, I think, I'm, I forget if I asked her at that point if she wanted to come to my room and she says, uh, we'll see, or something like that, or maybe later, so they kind of faded off, and I wander around, and then her husband comes up to me, or her friend comes up to me again and says, um, tell her you're interested in sort of interested in anal sex that you've never done it but you're kind of curious you know and this is sounding a little more strange to me all the time but you know I'm so you know I'm not committed to anything and um, anything that's worth a try to uh, you know you can always say no at any point so so I tell us he says I tell us Leah yeah. so I wander up to her and I tell her you know, she got a nice ass you know and I like to kiss her ass and shit like this, you know, and I'm sort of curious about anal eroticism, you know. From that, we, we chat about this and that and nothing, really. And I invite her to the room and she says, okay. So they come on. 
the two of them come in, and he stands in a little passageway. It was a single room, and she and I are on the bed. She's not really into foreplay that much, you know, like sometimes they went on a lot of hugging and kissing and touching and so forth, but she was pretty much into getting down. This is something you have to figure out, and I'll get into pointers later on, but at any rate, she was into getting down, so I just go down and start giving her some head, you know. And she liked it, and I gave her head for a while, and she wanted to give me head for a while, so she gave me head for a while, and then I I was wanted to try a little fucking, you know, so I got up on her, and she was into it, so that was my first time of the evening, and it wasn't long, and I just come everywhere. And so she laughs, and she says, well, that didn't take much. She says, but I didn't get off yet. And I says, well, we'll take care of you. And so I ease on back down and start giving her some more head. By this time, things were kind of messy. I mean, we had a lot of secretions going down here. And I mean, you know, here's where it takes a healthy attitude, and a lot of zen helps out. Anyway, I'm giving her head and giving her head, and she's talking about how good it is, and she loves it and so forth. And this guy's kind of standing there, maybe playing with himself a little bit and looking at things. And I think we're going along here, and it's pleasant. And I'm thinking, my God, this lady sure is wet. And I'm going along, and I'm thinking, my God, she sure is wet. And I get to thinking about the consistency of this moisture and the lubricant, you know. I mean, it's... It has a little higher viscosity than, say, water, you know. I mean, it's not as thick as oil, but it's thicker than water. And I'm noticing that this all this moisture in the area is, doesn't have that consistency, that it's more the consistency of water. And I'm getting to thinking, what is the deal here? And, uh, you know, I am just kind of having second thoughts, but I really didn't have anything concrete, that concrete dependent on until I feel this little spurt of liquid, you know, and like it wasn't like lubricant or anything like that. It was like pee, man, and it was coming out of the place where pee is supposed to come out. And I just kind of sat up, and I said, uh, hey, I'm sorry, but uh, you're peeing, and I'm really not into that. <laughs> She says, oh, no, I wasn't peeing, I was coming. And, you know, like I've read since then about some kind of gland that some women do have a, a kind of ejaculate. And I'm not necessarily saying that it's not true, that it's not possible. But uh, in this case, it was, it was the consistency of pee, and, you know, it had that slight aroma, although there was not that much of it that it smelled so bad, but... I'm pretty well convinced she was being. At any rate, that's what I said. And, and you know, she was nice about it. She says, oh, no, no. She says, I was coming, you know. And, but immediately, immediately, see, her her friend starts saying, well, come on, let's go, you know. It's, it's as if he knew what the story was, you know, like that they'd been through this routine before and that he knew the game was over and there's all these protestations were pretty much bullshitting in vain. At any rate, that, that's how I interpreted it. But... Just to let you know, kids, I mean, I can imagine. I mean, if you know what it feels like, you really got to be really bad. The feeling of release, man, when you finally, like, especially for me, like, I've been up in the woods at the hot springs up in Oregon, and laying there so stoned that I really didn't want to move. Until after a while, I got to pee so bad, and I don't want to pee in the pool. I mean, that's screwed. So you wander up in the woods, and there's nobody around and there's trees everywhere, you know. And you just stand there and just let it go. You don't have to worry about hitting the toilet or the urinal or anything. Any place you hit is fine. And just let it go. And it's a great feeling. And I can sort of imagine, although I don't think I could do it myself. I don't think I could pee and come at the same time. But I can imagine that it would be a good feeling to sort of just let it go, you know. If you combine the feeling of an orgasm with that release of peeing when you have to really bad. I mean, I'm... I can imagine that it would intensify things. There's no accounting for taste. Again, getting back to the Zen and attitude, there's no such thing as good and evil. You can't really look down on people. I mean, you can say, okay, they've had a different background, you know, different experience, different things turn them on that turn me on. But you can't say one is good or evil from a Zen point and you can't say really that one is sick or well. It's pretty much a matter of tolerance. You don't have to do anything that you want to, but you don't have to make anybody else feel guilty for how they feel. 
your general level of tolerance it's like there are a lot of people who've never thought about somebody peeing in their mouth or somebody shitting on the sheets, you know? It's never occurred to them. And there's a lot of other things like that, you know, body functions or things that people might be into, fantasies one way or another in sex. And hey, there's a whole area of fantasies that I haven't even touched. So there's a lot of people that have had a fairly limited fantasy life themselves. When they come into contact with somebody who's had a little more bizarre fantasy like say a girl who's fantasized about being tied up and fucked by a bunch of Indians screaming and yelling and stuff. For a guy who's never come across that and then have a girl present the idea, if he hasn't thought about it or hasn't thought about the range of human fantasy, he can be shocked by it, intimidated by it, and the girl feels put off and she feels like that she said something she shouldn't, that she's exposed in an area that this guy anyway, maybe not everybody, but this guy anyway seems to think is sick or degenerate. And man, as far as having sex with that guy, she's gonna not gonna, <laughs> she's gonna feel pretty intimidated. It's gonna be hard to relax, and, and she's gonna feel like she's got to be selective about what kind of things she can think about, what kind of fantasies she, she can have. And that's just one of the many things that can distract a male or female during sex. That's why there's more to eating pussy than just technique is you got to make people feel comfortable with anything that might get them off i mean like some girls okay are more sensitive in the anal area than others i mean some girls just are not interested in you touching their asshole and other girls it's like you can eat their pussy all day long and never get them off but if while you're eating their pussy you reach down and touch their asshole a little bit they'll come in a second so like I say, people's nerves seem to be distributed differently and you never can be sure. But okay, so there is this girl, imagine. She happens to have a lot of nerves around her asshole. And this guy, at the mirror's mention of, of you know, anything out of the way, uh, shit or whatever. Anyway, somehow he comes off giving the impression that he's kind of conservative and fastidious to the point of being offended by something like that and she's going to be shy about telling him and she's never going to get off. Sometimes people can have relationships for years and there's one small thing that one person could do to the other one that would get to their area of sensitivity and get them off and because for one reason or another one has made the other feel shy that thing never comes out and they never have a really satisfactory relationship. And this really is true as far as this having friends or anything else. If you come off in a first meeting with anybody as having really definite likes and dislikes, like I hate McDonald's and I, I love crepes, if you come off as a person who has views like that, they're going to start thinking, well, what kind of views does he have about sex or this, that, and the other. And the same is true with, you know, say just same-sex friendships. You meet a guy in business or socialize in one way or the other, and you come off as being some kind of an opinionated person. You'll never find out what that guy thinks. It depends. I mean, some people are more aggressive than others, but if you want to find out where people are, what they think about things, it's best not to come off as being too opinionated yourself. You know, I mean... It's better to come off as a person who can accept any point of view, who's really tolerant. And if you come off as that kind of a person, then people are going to be a lot more relaxed around you, are going to feel a lot more like letting you know what it is that turns them on. Like I had this one girlfriend that she's got the clitoris that you can't touch. I mean, you can't touch it, it's impossible. And the only place you can touch, the place that gets her off, is off to the side and up a little bit. I mean, it's like in an area that has no marking at all. <laughs> you got to find it by triangulation. But I mean, because I was interested in getting her off and she knew it, she wasn't hesitant about letting me know where her spot was. And once I found it, it's still hard to get her off. I mean, she's one of those people, but it helps if you're in the right spot anyway. And sometimes you're not going to find the right spot on your own. The only way you are is to make the other person feel comfortable enough to tell you. And that's why it's so hard to eat pussy. <laughs> to do it well. Because you gotta have your mind in the right place. Having your mind in the right place, I mean, that's a very complicated thing, you see. 
I found out at a fairly early age. I mean, I started getting all this feedback from people that I was a pretty smart fella. I mean, <laughs> they gave us an IQ test when I was in about the 10th grade, 9th grade, something like that. And this little 7th grader whose sister worked in the office and who'd happened to get a glance at my score, she told her little sister, and her little sister comes running up to me one day in the hallway saying, Norman, you've got the IQ of a genius. You're a genius. And, I mean, the word was out. But I had clues before that. I was considered above average in that area. At the same time, I never had been particularly athletic, you know. I mean, I wasn't that interested in sports or anything. And since I was getting all this feedback for being so smart, I never got into sports or athletics very much until I got to be about um, 29, 30, if you can believe that. What happened was drugs. I discovered marijuana. How old was I? About 28, I guess. And see, about the time I was 29, I had learned. <laughs> uh, let's see. Marijuana, marijuana. I guess that's, these days, that age is kind of late to be coming to marijuana. Like, I grew up in the South. And the South is always really behind times when it comes to picking up on that sort of thing. The whole time I was in college, I never heard of pot at all. And after college, I was in the Air Force for a while. And the word trickled down through Time Magazine and Newsweek. I was up in Montana when the Summer of Love was happening and the hate. And so I missed it all. I only got, like, third-hand reports. Most of what I read about marijuana was in the paper about people getting busted. And when all you hear about pot is about people getting busted, your ideas about it have a tendency to be pretty negative. But when I got out of the Air Force and I moved to Oregon, the guy across the hall smoked pot, guys walked down the street smoking pot, guys at work smoked pot, everybody I met almost smoked pot, and they didn't get busted. And I started realizing that what you don't read in the paper is you read about the one guy that got busted. You don't read about uh, 50,000 other people that same night that got high and didn't get busted, see? So I get a really distorted point of view. And being in that environment, an environment, that's something that's really important, but environment. Yeah, I got into smoking pot. And by the time I was 29, I was so fascinated with the feeling of being high and what it was like and trying to see what it was like. And I was reading some yoga and things about meditation and what happens in the mind, you know, kind of catching up on all this hippie shit and trying to explore all that related to marijuana and everything. And I wound up spending about a year in my spare time, kicked back in the living room, smoking pot and listening to the stereo and spacing out and thinking about things. Well, what happened, one of the things that happened after that time was the level of physical activity was so low that when my friends said, hey man, let's go for the hot springs, it was like a real exertion to hike the two miles back up into the wood. And I started realizing that my energy level was really low and from what I knew about biology and everything, I realized that the old saw about if you don't use it, you lose it applies to your muscles, you know, your ability to do anything. So I got into jogging, being in Oregon, and that's a pretty big thing up there. I got into jogging, and one of my friends at the time, this lady, was into getting up in the morning and getting high and dancing, putting on some rock and roll music on the stereo and standing in front of a mirror and dancing. And she was into meditation and all that too, you know? And she says, well, that's my form of meditation and exercise at the same time, which these days is not that unusual an idea. But I got into it and I started getting up in the morning and getting high and standing in front of a mirror and dancing. And one of the things about watching yourself dance in a mirror, you see how your body moves. And at first, it's sort of hard to see yourselves as others see us. But if you look at yourself long enough dancing, you begin to notice things and begin to see how your body might compare to other people's and what it is about the way your body moves that's graceful or not graceful. The fact that you got two sorts of input related to the same thing. You got the input coming from your muscles, saying that your legs are moving, your arms are moving, and you're feeling that. And you also got the input from 
your eyes and you can see those same muscles and bones moving. So you got two sources of stimulation that are in sync and the music's in sync too. And it gets you in tune with your body in a way that when you move, you can feel that your body is moving in rhythm with the music. I found out that really if what you're doing feels good, you don't have to look at the mirror to know that it looks good too, that it looks graceful and that it looks rhythmic and so forth. Sort of how I learned how to dance and learn also that kind of contact with what the body feels like, what the muscles feel like when they move. Well, so I also noticed that my arms were awful skinny when I threw them up into the air. And the only way I'd ever heard of to make them thicker and I thought they would look more attractive. And wow, that's an idea. What is beautiful and what is attractive? Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. One of the ideas I got from that is that your goal or your standard or whatever it is that you live by, it's arbitrary. I remember the, that was a discussion of Hector, I think, and his concept of what a person should do, what he should do, his idea of right behavior. It's pretty extreme, presented as the heroic idea, I believe. Well, beyond that, that gives you a, sort of a, an edge of it. And then uh, the other idea I got from the book was the idea of beauty, as beauty being something that maybe you couldn't define verbally, but that people have some kind of a sense of. I sort of, I guess, I, I adopted that as my philosophy, that there were some things that I responded to as being beautiful and some things that I responded to as being ugly, realizing that from a Zen point of view, one thing is no uglier than the other. Some things it's easier, easier to see the beauty of, and others you have to work harder at it. That just seems to be the way it is. And so I felt like, I mean, I sort of pursued the idea for a while that since being around those things that stimulate the idea in me that they're beautiful, they make me feel good, it makes me feel good to look at them, you know, ordinary things like a sunset or you know, a river running through a forest and all that kind of stuff, flowers, all those things make me feel good, whether, you know, without any, any necessary symbolic overtones. It's just, it seems to be, in my case, I'm not necessarily saying it's genetic that it's that point, but given my background and the way I grew up, there are some things that make me feel good as far as beauty. And the idea that I pursued was that if beautiful things are around you all the time, then you'll be happy all the time and your life will be a beautiful thing, a thing that it will make you happy to think about and look back on. And I sort of pursued that philosophy. And in pursuing that, and looking at myself dancing in the mirror, I decided that my arms could be more beautiful. I would rather see them be more rounded and less angular. And the same with my chest. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see it more in classical proportions. Maybe that's where I inherited my, or where I acquired my ideals. Because, you know, the statues of Michelangelo and that sort of thing, that kind of ideal of the human body. I wanted to look like one of those statues dancing. And those statues, while I'm thinking about it, that bring in another point of view make me think of like lions and horses and animals that because of their genes and the way they live their muscles are developed and exposed and move when they move and that is beautiful to me you know they look like competent creatures in the universe in their environment so I wanted myself to be like a lion or tiger in the environment when I walk through the woods instead of somebody looking at me and seeing an angular skinny man walking through the woods I wanted to see somebody that looked like a tiger that looked like a competent specimen in that environment a beautiful part of that environment my idea of beauty and how it related to my body and my development that's what we're talking about so I gradually got into pumping iron I started off with sort of calisthenics things, like the dancing got more vigorous, you know, and it got to be more like rhythmic exercise. And then I bought a set of weights and I did exercises at home. I did the things that came with the instructions in the book, you know, I did all those things. And I didn't see that much difference and I got kind of bored with it. So I sort of went back to dancing, except I danced with dumbbells in my hands, you know, and I gradually got them heavier and I moved my arms around and swung the dumbbells around. And one day I'm dancing in front of the mirror 
mirror with the dumbbells and I see that my trapezius muscles are sticking up above the bones in my shoulder like the trapezius muscles they're sort of like a diamond shaped area that goes from the top of your neck down to about the middle of your back and from shoulder to shoulder and they attach at the shoulder joint and when they're developed they run in a slanted line up to the back of the neck depending on how heavily they're developed well I saw little bulges there you know and that's the first visual evidence I had that I had made a change in my body and it really gave my efforts a boost so I went back to the routine in the instruction book because I realized that the dumbbells might be working on my traps as we say but that there was large areas of my body that were being neglected and that it was really a good way to get to them after working out on my own for a year I could see difference and people were starting to respond to me and saying, well I mean women that I met in other ways I mean people didn't walk up to me on the street or anything but women that I met in one way or another at one time or another would say wow you got a nice body or you know nice arms or feel my chest and say that's nice and wow that of course stimulated me even more so I joined a gym and started working out at the gym and doing the same routine I'd been doing and then I watched the guys at the gym and saw what they did and how they worked out and I realized well, one thing that a lot of these guys were working a lot harder than I ever did at home like when I was home and had nobody to pair myself to I thought I was working my ass off but I saw these guys are really pushing themselves to the limit and I realized that I could work harder too and I think that's one advantage in going to a gym rather than working out on your own is that you can learn from other people having been through a kind of a stubborn independent stage where I wanted to learn everything I felt like I could learn everything on my own which maybe I'll get into that it's not one of the brighter periods of my life but you know it's something that made me what I am but anyway I hated to think that somebody else could know something about something that I didn't <laughs> I got over it I think I have someone but anyway that's the advantage of going to the gym and anyway how this all relates is to my being a genius is that I had thought up until the time that I started seeing changes in my body I had thought that my happiness was pretty much totally dependent on the way my head worked and the way I thought about things and I suppose I had sort of the point of view of an intellectual that I had this big brain and it could solve all my problems and if I was unhappy that all I had to do was think about it and I could think about what it was that was making me unhappy and then I could change that thing and not be unhappy anymore well I found out that one of the reasons that I had been unhappy a lot was that I wasn't getting enough strokes from other people I guess everyone varies as to how much positive feedback they need from other people but I think everybody needs a certain amount I mean there are people that can live on islands and maybe they're you know exceptions in some ways but for the most part it makes the ordinary person feel good if somebody says to them wow you look good today it's like when I was an intellectual I wanted people to like me because of the way I thought I wanted to like me because I was bright and I had good ideas and the things I thought about things were interesting and exciting. I found people that liked me for that reason and they gave me good strokes but I never pursued the kind of good strokes that you get from people because you look healthy and because you look well-rounded and competent and so of course having never pursued them and having never had what it takes to get that kind of feedback from people I mean you can't get that kind of feedback from people unless you have a body right so once I did have the body and I did start getting all these good strokes from people I realized that one of the reasons <laughs> I'd been unhappy before was that I hadn't been getting those kind of strokes or my cumulative total wasn't as high as I felt comfortable with you know as so I got X amount of strokes from being smart but I got no strokes for being physically developed being physically developed added on X quantity of good strokes that I couldn't get any other way that I could never get by thinking about it I solved a problem physically that I could have never solved intellectually and it gave me a whole different point of view toward athletes and athletics in general and the kind of enjoyment you can get from feeling your body move
when you feel your body do something that you couldn't do before when you were a skinny little runt, you know, like uh, somebody's car stalls and they need you to help them push them off the freeway, right? And you can feel that it's a lot easier to push this car, and hey, you're really contributing a lot to making it go. And it even comes down to things like opening jars and stuff like that. If you have to struggle with them and everything, I mean, it's okay, you can struggle with them, you can get them open, it's no big thing, but it doesn't do your psyche any good, I mean, that you can't open a jar, that you need a jar opener to get it open. And so it's a small thing if your friend says, hey man, put some muscle on this thing, you know, it's a small thing. It's not that I should feel proud, now pride, that's another concept I'll have to talk about, but it's not that I feel proud necessarily that I'm better than this guy or that I look down on this person because I'm stronger than them, but let's face it, it's a boost that I can do something that not everybody can do, even when coming down to just open a jar. What I'm saying is that the brain is a great thing, but I don't think that it necessarily always can solve all your problems, that thinking or talking about them can always solve them, and that sometimes a thing that intellectuals, that I at any rate as an intellectual, would rebel at at one point, but sometimes muscle helps to be happy, and it's a good thing. And I mean, this applies to sex, and this applies to giving head too, I mean, because Okay, so this lady thinks you're a genius. I'm a genius. And the idea of being bounced on by a genius and having him squirt all in your body, there's maybe some sort of an intellectual thrill to that. But when she looks up and she sees this guy who's barely able to hold himself up above her and his thrusts are kind of weak and, and half-hearted, I mean, I suppose there's a sort of a satisfaction that can come from that. The motherly instinct is gratified maybe that this more or less helpless creature is in need of and being suckered by you and so forth but there's another kind of a thrill another kind of an enjoyment of this experience if you look up and you see the body of like superman or the hero in any of the movies or tarzan all those guys they can protect you when the bad guys attack and there are a lot of positive connotations i mean there are a lot of negative connotations too i mean there's the dumb brute stereotype of anybody with muscles can't have much of a head on their shoulders. If you run into somebody that that's a really a big part of their thinking, then you're not going to help out the situation very much by providing this image of the bulging muscles. So it doesn't work for everybody. I'm saying in general, there's a lot of conditioning in American society for women. And of course, the same thing goes for men. Like our idea of who's pretty. Yeah, there's an idea.